this edition of Mac Voices could have been sponsored by you. Mac Voices is always looking for sponsors who appreciate our high signal, low noise approach to tech topics with an Apple focus. Our sponsorship packages feature inclusion in all of the audio and video versions of Mac Voices at all of their distribution points, a web presence, inclusion in the Mac Voices Dispatch, our weekly newsletter, and more. Get the details by contacting me at chuck at macvoices.com or contact Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. And by Mac Voices Magazine, our free flipboard magazine that brings you some of the best Mac, iPhone, and iPad productivity tips on the web. High in signal, low in noise, just like Mac Voices, Mac Voices Magazine includes information on how you can get more out of your Apple technology. Subscribe at macvoices.com slash magazine or search for Mac Voices Magazine on Flipboard. Welcome to Mac Notables on Mac Voices. This is the Talk of the Mac community. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it's been entirely too long since we talked to Ted Landau. We had planned to get with him before Apple's announcements way back when, and it, our schedules just never let it happen, and so we're going to rectify that now and play a little catch-up. Ted, great <coughs> to see you. Yeah, it was, it was actually all your fault, but if you want to say it was our schedules, that's fine, too. I, okay. I don't remember that part. I, I thought there was something on your part. No, it's just always your fault. Okay, it's always <laughs> my fault. Well, all right. Uh, I'll accept the burden. I'll accept yeah. the burden. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to pick up where we left off, and this has been quite a while ago, uh, we were going to get back together and talk um, right around the time of Apple's announcements, uh, the, the spring announcements, I'll call them, mm -hmm. since they're a bit in our rearview mirror. N now we can't speculate on what they're going to be because they've already been. So mm -hmm. what was your reaction to them? Wait, I'm going to predict what they're going to be. <laughs> <laughs> um <clears throat> I have the answer in this envelope right here. Yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah well, uh, the, the, the announcements certainly weren't earth-shattering by any means. Uh, a smaller iPhone hardly is going to shake up the world, uh, though apparently uh, there's a demand for that. It seems to be fairly popular. I, I personally think the iPhone 6, well, I know you have a 6 Plus, so I shouldn't say, but I personally think the iPhone 6 is a near-perfect size for me, and, and I would never want to go back to a smaller size. Uh, if anything, I'm, I think about maybe someday moving up to the 6 Plus size, but, but for now, I'm more than happy with the 6. Um, <clears throat> beyond that, I, the, the, big, the, the biggest announcement was the one that most thrilled me, and that was the, um, the iPad Pro 9.7-inch. Uh, I bought one uh, almost immediately after, after the announcements. It was, uh, my iPad, I had an original iPad Air, and it was um, you know, about three years old, I guess, and it was still working. I mean, it wasn't like I was forced to upgrade, but uh, but I had been waiting for enough of a change in the in the iPad to to make me want to um, to get to get a new one, and the the Pro you know tipped the needle for me, and I was I've been real happy with it. the the, the biggest the, the the biggest differences for me is um, number one the speed. Uh, I didn't realize how much of a difference it was going to make, but thing speed and memory. Th it, uh, now it can hold more um, apps in memory at one time, and so like when I shift back and it used to be when I shifted back and forth between two apps, every time I went back to the old app, it had to reload because it could, apparently couldn't hold in memory the the uh, information. Now more often than not, I can have two or three apps that I can switch between, and the memory sustains itself pretty well. Uh, and also, apps load and shifts occur much, much faster than they did before. It's just a pleasure to use. Um, <clears throat> that, the, the, now it has the Touch ID for, for, you know, the fingerprint identification, which my uh, didn't have, which is, which is quite nice as well. Um, and um, the, um, oh crap, I forgot the, the other thing that was, I was thinking of now that I was going to say that I really liked on it. Um, <clears throat> I will say I got the keyboard. Um, if I if I remember the other thing that I liked, I'll get I'll I'll let I'll let you know when I get back to it. But for now, I got the keyboard, and that's been a mixed bag. Uh, the, the first thing that that um, well, first let me say I like that you can get the, the Apple keyboard. That 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 wasn't even an option with, with the other ones. Uh, I liked the I liked the keyboard in that it it made it so that that the keyboard almost wasn't there when I wasn't using it. I, I had a Logitech keyboard uh, with my old iPad uh, Air, and I didn't use the keyboard a lot. 
I used it more or less when I traveled, but mostly at home I wasn't using it. And so, but the the problem I had with it is that you couldn't not, when you had the keyboard on, it was so in your face and in your way that there was no way that you could use the iPad without the keyboard. You actually had to take the keyboard case off to use it, or it was just a pain. Uh, and so. Every time I wanted to use the keyboard, I had to take one case off, put the other case back on. Um, with with the smart keyboard from Apple, that's not the case. When I fold it up, it's almost it's, it's a little bit heavier, but otherwise, it's almost like the keyboard isn't there. It's really great. Uh, I found it a bit um, annoying to try to figure out how to uh, create how to get the keyboard set up. Uh, I, I ultimately figured out that if I turn the iPad upside down, so the case is so the rear of the case, the rear of the iPad is facing up that I can pretty much intuitively set up the keyboard from that position. But if I try to do it with the cover facing up, uh, I wind up spending 10 minutes trying to you know, solve a Rubik's Cube problem before I can get it to work. Uh, so that, and, and also, it doesn't have a good position to be a stand when you're not using the keyboard. Uh, uh, I, I had a, a Moshi uh, a smart cover, uh, the, the um, oh, I forget, the, the origami one. I mean, the origami, the Moshi origami was a great cover for converting to a stand as well. Um, the Apple smart keyboard does not convert to a stand well at all. So it was a mixed thing, but it, uh, but it's it's nice having it's nice now that I can when I want have a keyboard that I don't have to um, remove if I don't want to use the keyboard. That's the biggest thing. I haven't gotten the pencil. I don't see any big need for that. Maybe someday just for fun I'll get it, but so far no. Yeah, I've had my hands on the pencil three times in Best Buy. And, and put it back just because I've, I'm not an artist and so I've, I've wanted one just for the sake of trying it as far as um, as interacting with the with the interface with a pencil mm -hmm. but it still just doesn't feel like it's for me at this point maybe it will be at some point but not just yet I am curious so have you have you tried or worked with split screen options ah. There you go. That was the other thing I was going to mention. Good. Okay. <laughs> um, that was the one I couldn't remember before. Uh, yes, you know, the original iPad Air, you could have that slide over view, um, but, you couldn't act, but it didn't have the processor power to actually support the full screen split view. And um, that, that's been great, too. I've used it several times. I, in honesty, I don't use it as often as I thought I would. There aren't, there aren't that many things that I do with the iPad where I have to have both uh, apps as uh, in half screen, so to speak. The, the slide overview, the slide overview, I use a lot, and, and it's actually again like everything else, a lot faster than it was on the original iPad. Um, but uh, but the, the split view is is really great. It works beautifully. Uh, but I, I just I don't use it as much. Uh, you know, if 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 I depended on the iPad more as my primary or almost primary computer, I probably use it more. Uh, but I don't so. Yeah, I I find it obviously it, it because with an iPad Pro the the, the big one, um, it's I think it's more useful because you have more screen real estate. Right. But I started I sort of got hooked on that on the on the large iPad Pro, and then when I got the 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 small iPad Pro, the <laughs> I don't know how else to describe it. Um, I, I found that that kind of trans transitioned over, and again I think you're right because of the power of the, the the processor, it it became a very viable thing. And so now I, I almost don't remember how I used an iPad without having, at, at the at the very least, just the ability to to reach over and pull the one side off just a little bit to see mm -hmm. another app. Mm -hmm. So it's it's made a I think it's made a big big difference. I feel like it's the first thing that really took the iPad to that point where. It, it takes it to the next level of a productivity machine. I'm not sure that it's going to replace uh, a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro anytime soon, but it felt like it's a step. Yeah, I don't know that that it will ever for me at all. I can, you know, I am so dependent on ha talk about multitasking. I mean, one of the big differences between a Mac and an iPad uh, still is that a Mac, I can have eight applications open at once. And each of them can have three or four windows, so we're talking about, you know, 24 windows, you know, to, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but still, uh, I can have 24 windows open on my Mac at one time and very easily um, shift from one to the other and view maybe six or seven windows at one time and drag things, uh, 
uh, you know, I can highlight some text or highlight a graphic and drag that graphic from one window to the next or uh, drag it to the desktop if I want to save something as a, as a, as a file to the finder. Um, you can't do anything like that on an iPad, and and that's such a that's such a loss that that I I you know I, there's a lot of times when I'm working on the iPad where I do things, and essentially what I'm doing is is a temporizing you know it's sort of like well I want to remember this web page because I want to be able to quote it later or or I want to remember this data or I want to do something, uh, and I will do it in such a way on my iPad so that when I later get to my Mac I can really do it. Uh, I never feel like I'm getting the entire job done on the iPad. Now, I know other people do, but uh, um, not me. <clears throat> We've had this discussion before. I, st I still think it's a mistake, much like the, uh, the iPhone SE that you mentioned. There's such a, a rush to judgment on everything about, okay, well, this is, this is useless and this is great. And, you know, a, a, a pair of size 7 shoes are not going to do me any good. But neither are a pair of size, you know, 14s either. You've got to find the right thing for you. And whether that's an iPad, whether it's a MacBook, a MacBook Air, you know, a, a Mac, Mac Pro, a, an iMac, you know, or an iPad Mini. You know, whatever works for you and, and solves your problems is the right device for you. Yeah. It seems simple. Yes, um, I certainly wouldn't argue anybody. I wouldn't argue with anybody over why they like what they like and telling them that that, that what I like is better. That's that's certainly true. I mean, yeah. But I will say that the iPad Pro is a great machine, and for anybody that has uh, an iPad that's several years old that they've been wondering whether now is a good time to update, I would say now is a good time. How much memory did you get? It? How much storage? Uh, I got one 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 hundred twenty-eight. Okay, you got the one twenty-eight. What what had you had before? Sixty four, and I was running out of space. So. Now, what uh, at the at the risk of digging too deeply into this, but do you have that many apps on on there, or were you storing videos or uh, some video, but uh, but mostly apps? Yeah, uh, I, uh, that's another odd thing about the the iPad. You know, on a Mac, you can have a thousand apps in your applications folder. And even if you only use 30 of them, the other 900 and whatever, 70, 8 of them, 970, um, are there waiting whenever you want to use them. But on an iPad, if you, you know, if you don't install them on your iPad and you keep them in iTunes, then they're inaccessible. So, so if you decide you want to sa save space by, by not having them on the iPad, it's as if they don't exist anymore. You, you, I, after a while, I forget I even own them. Sometimes I'm, I'm, I'll read an article about some application, uh, an app for the iPad. I'll say, oh, that sounds interesting. And I'll go to download it, and it says I already own it. <laughs> I say, oh, wow. I, 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 I looked at that two years ago and forgotten because I didn't like it and... Uh, after I checked it out and I left it in my iTunes library and took it off my iPad. Uh, it's particularly true for me with like text processing, which is something, you know, writing text stuff is something I do quite often, um, on, even on the iPad. And I have like 12 or 13, whatever, <laughs> I'm saying 12 or 13, I don't know, 12, 12 or 13, yes, I've actually counted them. Um, <clears throat> I have a dozen or so, that sounds better. Uh, a dozen or so text processors that I keep on my iPad, even though I hardly ever use any of them, just so that when the time comes that I want to be able to see which one I like better, I can check it out because I'm not going to go back and and install them, you know, just to check out whether I, I like one or two. So having the room to have a lot of stuff on the iPad that I don't use, I guess, is where I'm going here, uh, works well for me, or I don't use very often, I should say, works well for me, and so I, I keep an enormous number of apps on the iPad. I've had exactly the same experience about going and looking at seeing a write-up on something. It's like, oh, that looks cool, and then find out that I've, I either have it on like this seventh or eighth screen back, or have taken it off. But I also find that now I'm suddenly using more apps. I'm, I'm thinking about using more apps, and I can't decide whether it's me that I've changed my my not my attitude toward the iPad because the attitude was always good, but just my my thinking about using it. Or if the apps have just matured a little bit more, so that now they're suddenly useful. Mm -hmm. And, and do you, any any thoughts on that from your experience? I don't find that I'm using more apps now. Uh, I I find I find that I rarely use new apps. I, almost the opposite from what you're saying. I I find like there was like this gold rush of 
trying to find all the great apps and uh, and and now I hardly ever add new apps. In fact, sometimes I'll feel, you know read an article that says the ten apps you mu absolutely must have on your iPad today. You know, typical link bait type headline. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and I'll go to it, succumbing to the to the allure. And I, almost all the time, I'll find either I already have the app, or I don't have the app, and I know about it, and I don't want it, or I've never heard of it, and I still don't want it. Um, the the number of times I've actually found some new app that I've then downloaded and been happy to start using is relatively rare. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. So, again, at the risk of asking something we shouldn't, what are, what is your primary use for your iPad right now? My primary use now is for consumption. I don't use it a lot for creating stuff. Um, I I have. The, the main thing I, I do a lot of now is, number one, news. I, I, I have finally made the transition from print to iPad. Uh, I still get Sunday papers delivered in print, but partly that's because the Sunday papers are so huge that I, I like to have them in a print version. And the other thing is it gives me a free, a, a free subscription to the digital edition. I, I don't have to separately pay for that. Uh, and and during the week, I am reading um, you know the New York Times almost cover to cover on the iPad, uh, and the San Francisco Chronicle and um, Time Magazine. I still get a subscription to in print as well, but I will I will look at that online as well. And then there's just a host of other things. You know, the news articles from Twitter. I'll, I'll check my Twitter feed on my iPad and and do a lot of uh, reading of articles that that show up on my Twitter feed. I'll go through Flipboard. Uh, and find articles that way. I'll just go on to Safari and find articles that way. Uh, I'm just in, doing an incredible amount of reading on the iPad every day. Uh, I also use it uh, as my primary information checker. You know, whenever any, whenever anyone, me or my wife or anybody in the house says, you know, what, you know, uh, you know, what, when was the last time so and so was in a movie? You know, when was when, when was the, when was the last time that uh, uh, Jack Nicholson appeared in a movie? Uh, nine times out of ten, I will grab the iPad to get the answer to that sort of thing, uh, rather than going to a Mac or something like that. I have, I have an Amazon Echo. Sometimes we'll use that as as well, um, but most of the time, especially if there's any visual content involved that the Echo can't handle, I will I, I, I use the the um, the iPad to look things up. Unless I'm sitting at my desk, you know, if I'm sitting at the iMac uh, and I'm, I'm actually there, I'll use it. But but. But more often than not, no. Checking movie times, things like that. Uh, uh, YouTube videos. Uh, what, you know, I'll do a lot of YouTube video watching uh, on the iPad. Hmm. I, I realize that you've you've retired from writing, actively writing, and so that kind of thing just consumes a lot less time or occupies a lot less time. Um, do you find yourself getting away from your iMac Be because no, because you have it in your in your lap or in your hand? Yeah, a little bit more, but like I said, the iMac is still my default device for, you know, it, it's sort of everything funnels into the iMac. The iPad is nice, but uh, like I said, I might, uh, I'll, uh, if, I, if I'm reading an article on the iPad and I want to save it, I'll save it to the reading list, say, in Safari. Uh, but that's just so that when I go to my iMac, I can get it out of the Safari reading list and, and save it someplace else. Uh, I, I, you know, I save too many things. If I saved everything I wanted to save um, in the reading list, you know, I, I'd, I'd never find it again because I'd have 5,000 things in the reading list. Uh, I've, I've got, gotten into saving articles as files uh, in the Finder, and I, and I put them into folders by category. And, and, uh, and so I'll have a politics file, and a science folder, and an Apple-related folder, and a current events folder. And, uh, and then... I, and, the truth is, I rarely go back. It's, it's, it's just more, I guess, obsessive compulsive. You know, the truth is, when I, uh, I discovered that when I actually remember an article that I want to look at again, that I know is in my file somewhere, at least 50% of the time, I'll just research for it in Google because it's actually faster than finding it um, on my computer. But for those times when I don't want to do that or when the Google search initially fails because I can't recall enough about the information to bring it up, it's nice to have it uh, in, in the finder. I can usually find it that way. Yeah. I, I, I think we're all 
struggling, well, some of us are struggling to give up that folder structure. I still find myself keeping certain things in folders, but I'm slowly getting away from it. Um, more like you say, the search technology is so good now that I, I just, I, I have, what, what my, my documents folder used to be you know, very, very strictly organized. Not so much anymore because I can, I can find it. You know, it's, if, if yeah. I, with two or three yeah. keywords, I can find it. Yeah, and I have given up to some extent on the folder, even though I'm, I just said that I put them all into these folders. The, the real truth is that I've partially given up on that, and I now um, have folders organized by date. Um, so, in other words, I have an April 2016 folder, which, in which I save every file that I s saved in April, regardless of the topic. Uh, I'm still saving it to a folder, so that's true. But now I don't have to think anymore. What category does it go into? You know, does it go into the science folder or the religion folder or the politics folder? And what do you do with an article that seems to overlap all three of those categories? And then where do where do I look for it later when you know when I don't remember exactly which cat? So now I just have ah, the hell with it. You know, I, I just. <laughs> I got it in April. It goes into the April folder, and if I ever need it again, I'll I'll you know search all files and probably find it. So. <laughs> We're about to go down the the path of of folders versus tagging, and let's not do that. That'll, we'll be we'll be here all night. I've never got. I've never. I'm lazy. I've never gotten into tagging, unfortunately, because it's just another step. You know. Then I uh, and. Uh, I'd love it if, if I if I had the patience to do it, but I, I don't even tag my photographs. It just I just I, I can't spend the time to think about it. So. Yeah. Well, the thing about tagging, of course, that and I've done a very 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 limited amount of it, but it's the idea that you don't have to put it into religion or politics or you know, current events. That you can just you know apply all three of those labels, and then it's it's essentially in all three of those virtual folders. It works great if you have the patience to do it and if you do it perfectly. I mean, because what happens if there's some article that is about religion tangentially and you forget to do the religion tag and then six months later you're searching for it by looking for the religion tag and it doesn't come up. Uh, and then you say, well, what happened to it? You know? yeah. Well, what happened to it is you screwed up when you tagged it, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. um, which I'm sure I would do a lot of times. So. Yeah. Um, before we, we leave hardware, I just I did want to touch on something else that came out since you and I have talked, and that's the new MacBook. And I'm pretty yeah. sure that that came out since since we yeah. talked. Um, any interest in it? I, I've I know that your iPad is is your primary mobile machine, but uh, any any thoughts or impressions on that particular device? I mean, I think it's great if you if you're looking for a new MacBook. I I do still have a MacBook Pro. You know, I'm I'm I don't have a shortage of Macs in our house, <laughs> so um, we are a Mac rich family. Uh, and I do have a MacBook Pro. It's several years old now. I think it's from probably 2013. I think um, <clears throat> maybe even older. I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> but I have. Uh, it's perfect. It's it, it's one of those things where for our, my needs, which are fairly minimal. Um, it's working perfectly. In, in fact, I think we may have talked about this before. Uh, I now have it set up so that my wife Naomi has an account and I have an account, um, which for some reason it never occurred to me to do initially. Um, she was always working on on the when she wanted to borrow the laptop, she was borrowing it and using it in my account, which then would get annoying. So now, and she's gotten comfortable with that, and so we switch back and forth between accounts and. She, when she needs a laptop, she uses it on her account. When I need a laptop, I use it on my account. Uh, and um, it does everything that I want from the laptop. There, there isn't anything that the Mac, the new MacBook would do that I can't do on the one that I have now. So I, I don't see any reason to get a new one. Yeah, just curious. Just curious. Ted, I guess the, the the next topic I wanted to touch on, since since this is a lot more recent, were were Apple's financial results, and the the furor that's come with Apple finally breaking their string of some I don't even know I'm afraid because I didn't prepare for it, but uh, some incredible string of record setting quarters. 13, now, thirteen years worth, I think. Thirteen years. I mean, th thirteen years. Think mm. about that. They have been. Wow, I hadn't thought about it in those terms. They broke records every quarter since before Mac Notables and Mac Voices started. I mean, that's almost mind-boggling. Before many of the people working in tech were born. 
That's another interesting point. Yes. <laughs> All those 12 year olds, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I know you're joking, but there's a lot of truth to it. There's, there's a lot of truth to it. Is, I mean, I, I know we, we've been inundated with Apple is, is doomed stories, and obviously Apple is not doomed by one quarter. But do you think that uh, th this is a, a bellwether of any kind? I think it's significant. I, you know, the Apple is doomed stuff annoys me as, as much as I'm sure it annoys you and anybody else. I mean, it annoys me both because it's patently untrue. If, there was one tweet. I, there was one tweet. There was one article I, I tweeted about that somebody wrote in which they were complaining about how you know this you know how this obviously means that Apple is in deep trouble and and you know they, and and how they're going down the wrong road and this and at one point in the article they they said something like no wonder they only sold 51 million iPhones this quarter. <laughs> what? You're citing the sale of 51 million iPhones as evidence that they're doomed? <laughs> uh, sorry, that isn't going to work exactly. Uh, and so, yes, regardless of, of whatever it means and whatever negatives it has, this is still one of the largest, you know, if not the largest company on earth. It's still it's still turning a profit. It's not like the revenue loss meant they were in the red by any means. Uh, they're they're still chugging along just fine. And so, you know, you know, every company has had its ups and downs. Uh, Facebook, when when it had its IPO, the stock went down shortly thereafter, and people were talking for a while about what a mistake it was for facebook to go public and isn't doing well and twitter is perennially in trouble because it can't seem to make enough money from advertising and uh, and, they're, and trying to figure out how to monetize twitter is is, is it can be uh, difficult and and yet nobody nobody regularly anyway uh, is ready to jump on the bandwagon that that says facebook is doomed every time something negative happens to facebook or twitter is going to go out of business tomorrow which it clearly isn't uh, and yet when something bad happens to Apple, it's and the Apple is doomed. People come out of the ground, you know, like groundhogs on Groundhog Day. You know, so we're checking to see if they can see their shadow. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it is annoying. On the other hand, um, I, I I think you know at some point, like anything else, you know, I, I follow basketball a lot, and I'm enjoying the Warriors. That's, being here in the Bay Area, and and one of the things that I think about as I see the Warriors doing so well, is that no matter how great a team you had, whether it was the Boston Celtics uh, of the Bill Russell years or Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls or Magic Johnson's L.A. Lakers, whatever, no matter how great the team was, it doesn't stay great forever. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me. Tim Cook calling. Uh, it doesn't stay great forever. You know, there, there's a, there's a, inevitably, um, there's a plateau and sometimes a, a downward turn, sometimes a pretty big downward turn. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and that's true with companies, too. I mean, I, 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 Apple isn't going to be, you know, the idea that somehow Apple was going to set record-breaking profits every quarter from now until infinity and beyond, uh, to borrow a phrase from Toy Story, uh, is just patently absurd. At some point it was going to stop happening and it doesn't mean necessarily that they're in trouble but when it does happen it might mean that something significant has happened at, at Apple and, and the, the, the things that came to mind most for me is I think two things are interplaying. One is I think sales um, are probably down a bit because people aren't upgrading hardware as much as they used to. And I think that's a problem across the board, not just with Apple. Uh, the computer industry has matured and stabilized, and and sans some totally new product that that shakes things up the way the iPhone did, which I don't see happening anytime soon. Um, that that the market has gotten to a point where people, where where people are holding on to their their products three four years instead of one two years. And well, you know, if somebody holds a product for four years instead of two years that cuts your hardware sales in half essentially if everybody were to do that uh, and, and so that that makes a big difference and to some extent I, I think Apple can't do not that they can't do anything about that to some extent that's a problem that, that isn't not, not unique to Apple and not entirely Apple's fault on the other hand uh, I think there are parts of it that Apple could do something about and we could lay the blame on Apple and in particular um, for the Mac uh, and there was an article in the Mac Observer by, um, oh, I, I think I have his name here, just a second. 
Um, <clears throat> I can't find it now. Uh, yes, here, uh, by, by John Keat, if, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, called Apple's Failure to Scale. You can link to it. And he talks about how, um, particularly at the pro end of the Mac, um, Apple has done very little in recent years. That the cinema display, the Thunderbolt cinema display, is still um, the, the most recent display that Apple has come out with. Um, there's no sign of a 4K or 5K display anywhere on the horizon, though they could surprise us and come out with one tomorrow, I don't know, but they're certainly not indicating that that's, that's the case. Uh, the, the Mac Pro, which, which came out with such um, fanfare back in 2013, and where Phil Schiller famously said, you know, um, you know something, to something to the effect of, who, you know, who says we can't innovate, and I think he said in a bit harsher terms than that, but uh, that was the idea. Uh, and yeah, well, it was very different, and it hasn't changed since 2013. It's now th almost three years later, and, it's, and, and there hasn't been a single update to it. Nothing. Um, uh, one terabyte of, of, of SSD is still the maximum, I think, that you can get pre-installed. Um, might be higher than that, but whatever it was initially, that's what, that's what it still is. Uh, and, and, you know, and the iMac. You know, my, I just got a new iMac. A couple months ago, I, I think you know that we've talked about, uh, and I, I waited until the Skylake processors came out. Right? It didn't have USB-C, it didn't have Thunderbolt 3. I said, I don't care about those things much anyway. Uh, I'm going to get it. And, and I've really enjoyed it. It's been great. But my wife has a new iMac that she got about two or three years ago. In fact, you're probably seeing it behind me right now. That's hers right there. And it doesn't have a lot of the internal hardware that mine has, but it looks identical. And it functions identical. I mean, if I if my wife sat down in front of my iMac versus hers, she wouldn't say, "Oh my God, what a difference! This is a totally different iMac." She'd say, "I don't know which one I'm using." More likely, I can't tell whether it's yours or mine. The difference is just whatever they are will just float over her head. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Which then gets begs the question: You know, why should anybody with my wife's iMac think about getting one like mine? When over the course of three years, they're hardly any different from their, from most people's perspective, uh, and uh, and so it goes. Uh, I, you know, I think um, Apple probably. Um, uh, now, see now, my cat is trying to get back in, <laughs> um, and he has done so. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I I think Apple would do well to pay more attention to the Mac than it has. Uh, and, um, and and think about there must be something that worth doing. I I, I, mean, I suppose if I thought about it, I could come up with ideas, but it's not my job to do so. Um, that that could start differentiating um, the new Macs from the old ones and get people excited about getting a new Mac again, which certainly hasn't been the case. It's it. I, I feel sorry for the for the folks at Apple and in, in the tech industry in general. Um, the last few years, we've watched televisions. You know, obviously, the TV manufacturers want you to buy a new TV all the time. They tried to throw uh, 3D at us, mm -hmm. and that kind of failed. They tr have tried the curved screens, and that's had a little bit more traction. This year, it seems to be the ultra-high definition um, stuff, and f some of that stuff is finally um, – and, and, and oh, no, excuse me – the HDR. Yeah. Is is now the new thing, and that does seem to actually ha be a difference, a benefit, as opposed to some of the flashy stuff and and all that. So, I I I, I see a lot of similarities here. You know, Apple needs to do something to the these machines to make them new and sexy and and appealing uh, for the average person. And you said it real well. You know, for most people. But it's becoming tougher and tougher. Speed is not as much of an issue as it used to be. And then if they do bring out something that's new and sexy and flashy and can only run on a new machine, then people complain about, well, you know, I just bought this machine last year or two years ago, and what do you mean it won't do this? So yeah. it's it's a tough, tough thing right now. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that was the two sides that I was trying to present, that on the one hand, I think there's more that Apple can do, but on the other hand, I recognize there's only so much Apple can do because it's an industry-wide problem, like you said. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of ultra high definition, I just got a new 43 inch um, ultra high definition TV. Oh. Um, I, I decided to get last year's Vizio 
uh, model because it was so highly rated before it went off the shelves. Um, a great deal for like four hundred and fifty dollars. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but I, what I've discovered, not too much to my surprise, along the lines of what you're saying, in fact, is that um, the ultra high definition is not at all worth it to me at this point. Number one, I have a TiVo Romeo, which is my main source of getting television uh, onto my screen, and it doesn't support 4K. I have to update to a, to a TiVo Bolt with, to do that, which I have no interest in doing. And so I can't get any, any 4K content onto the TV to begin with, coming from my Romeo. Number two, I can get it. It turns out that the, that the TV has um, Netflix and Amazon built into the TV itself. You know, it's a quote-unquote smart TV. And so I could, I could log on to Amazon directly through the TV and play the 4K content that's in Amazon's library. Um, you, there's some 4K content that you can get as an Amazon Prime user. So I tried that out. And at, at the 43-inch size, which is a fairly small size for 4K, I admit, um, I couldn't tell the difference, really. Uh, maybe a tiny bit, but, but hardly worth getting. You know, not enough to say, oh my god, I have to run out and get a... 4K TV. So even when I even when I was playing it, it wasn't that spectacular. And so basically, and and then of course there's the third thing, which is currently there's hardly anything that in 4K anyway. Uh, and and I, and they're coming out now with 4K Blu-ray players, and I could care less because the direction I'm going in is to abandon optical discs altogether. These days, everything I, uh, you know, if I want to buy something, I buy it as a as in, from from an iTunes download or something like that. And, uh, I may never buy another Blu-ray disc again, just about. Um, and I'm certainly not interested in investing in a new $500 Blu-ray player specifically to handle 4K that I don't care about. So um, <clears throat> it, 4K currently is going nowhere for me. I think, you know, eventually, just like 1080p at one point was not very well represented. At one, you know, sometime down the road, 4K will be the standard and everybody will have it and everybody will use it and that will be fine. But but for the next few years, I don't, I don't see me having much use for it. Yeah. Now, when I went to NAB a couple of weeks ago, um, I shot my interviews with a GoPro Hero Four, which is a 4K camera, um, and I've I learned a lot about being able to shoot with 4K, especially when you're publishing to YouTube or to podcasts, because now. I, I can zoom I can zoom a lot I can reposition things around I've still got some a lot to learn with that so 4k has its advantages from that standpoint but just as far as looking good I mean yeah it looks great but when you're talking about the commercial productions I'm with you I, they, they look gorgeous and of course anytime you walk into any of the showrooms they have the demo reels up and they they look phenomenal but you bring them home you feed them Comcast signal or a dish signal or whatever mm. and it's like I don't. Okay, maybe a little bit better, but if I'm wa watching casually, I mean, unless I'm really watching critically and looking at the lines and the edges, it's it just doesn't strike me as 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 worth it at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, my understanding is the, you know the 4K that you get from Netflix and Amazon is compressed and then decompressed, and so you're you're losing detail right there, uh, and so it's not going to look like the you know the big 70 inch screens in Best Buy. With the special running the special 4K content designed to show it off, that's not how it's going to look when you're watching Netflix through your TiVo <laughs> that doesn't even handle 4K yeah. uh, at, at home. So on, on your 43 inch screen, so I mean it's, it's just a different experience, absolutely. Yeah. Well, when you start looking at if you take your Blu-ray or even just a DVD and rip rip it off using handbrake or something look at the size file you get and, and supposedly that's uncompressed or as uncompressed as you're going to get in that delivery medium and then you look at the size of the file you download from itunes mm -hmm. something's being lost along the way yeah. a lot of it is probably not visible but something's still being lost mm -hmm. and it becomes more visible in 4k i think i mean you're dealing with you're, you're asymptoting out anyway you know, you're, 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 you're reaching the limits of what the eye can distinguish at any normal viewing distance. I mean, they could go to 8K in a few years from now, for instance, or 16K, whatever the next multiple would be. And I don't think anybody would be able to tell the difference unless you have a 500-inch screen that you're looking at from, from across the, you know, uh, the block and from your neighbor's house to your house or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but but uh, 
Um, so we're, we're reaching the limits anyway. And so when you're reaching the limits, uh, you, you need you, you know it needs to be everything has to be falling. All the cards have to be lined up just right in order for you to really see the difference. Uh, and and if there's a weak link in one or two places, it can just wipe out whatever positive effect the forecast is having. Yeah, that's another industry. It's it's going to be interesting to see what they try to give us next. Um, and not not that they're a bunch of shysters. That's not what I mean. But just you know, they they need something to differentiate last year's set from this year's set. So what what are they going to tell us? I don't know. It's it's a little bit sad to me that 3D failed so miserably. Um, I, I you know I thought 3D had some promise, but it really it's like. It's like they don't even include 3D in this year's TVs, just about. So. Well, I don't, I don't know about you. No, I, I don't mind. No, that's not fair. I enjoy going to see 3D in the theater. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think this is a spoiler, spoiler to anyone in this audience, but the best, one of the best 3D effects I saw was in the, was in the last Star Wars movie. Where I don't know if you saw it in 3D or not, but there's that one shot of the the one Star Destroyer, and you would swear that it's cut right out of the screen and hanging over the audience in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's ab absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. Some of the rest, you know, I'm not sure it makes that much of a difference, but it's it's nice and it's different. But I can't say that if I then come home and a few months later watch that movie on my home TV without for uh, 3D that I really say, oh, gee, it, it was so much better in 3D. Well, and also, I mean, the biggest the biggest um, problem I think with 3D at home is that you need glasses to see it. And you know, people, you know, imagine imagine if everything on 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 television went 100% 3D, like it's 100% HD now, uh, more or less. I mean, you can still get standard definition TV, but basically, any almost anything you want to watch is now available in HD. Imagine if it was like like that for 3D. Well, you're not going to walk around wearing a pair of 3D glasses all day, so that every time you happen to turn on your TV, you're ready to see it in 3D. And not to mention, you know, which uh, if you're getting if you're inviting people over to watch your program, you're going to have maybe have to have five or six pair of glasses to make sure that everybody can watch it in 3D, which you might not own. So, um, it 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 was that was I think that was something that they couldn't get past. Yeah. Hey, we're, we're running, starting to run out of time, and something that we hadn't talked about pre-show, but uh, just came out, and I think I've got the pronunciation right, Rovi, is it that the name, bought TiVo, mm -hmm. and, and they're going to take the TiVo name, um, and I know you're a big TiVo fan, I've been a big TiVo fan for a long time, are, are you concerned? I'm not going to be concerned until someone tells me I have to be. Um, <laughs> It sounded pretty good from my reading of it. It sounded like you know they're keeping the TiVo name, they're keeping the TiVo technology. It looked like a pretty good synergy where TiVo has this incredible hardware and 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 software system, and Rovi not so much, but they had a, a pretty large installed user base, uh, and so you put them together, and it was like okay, let's take TiVo's hardware, and now we can sell it to many more people. Um, and that would be good for TiVo because one of, the, one of the perennial problems that TiVo has is that not enough people are buying it. I think also T TiVo may be helped by the the new ruling which Obama you know weighed in on the other week that said um, we should um, essentially open up the rules for set top boxes so that so that uh, third parties can be more competitive with the with the cable companies for the set top boxes that that, that run. Uh, on the company's uh, cable system, so which would mean you know right now I think if you if you for instance if you go with Comcast, I don't know what the actual numbers are, but I wouldn't be surprised if ninety five percent of the people who use Comcast have a Comcast set top box because that that's the way Comcast promotes it, and they don't want you to go anyplace else, uh, and they make it hard to go anyplace else. Uh, it's, even setting up my TiVo was a as you probably know can, can be a pain. Um, if they make it so that set-top boxes become plug-and-play, like equivalent of TVs, where you can just go to, to Staples and pick up a set-top box and expect that it will work with your Compass system without any hassle, that will be a big difference, and that's the direction that they're talking about going in. Yeah, I, I saw that announcement, and I guess I, I have mixed feelings on it, because Comcast, I mean, that would be a big hit to Comcast's um, revenue sources. Now, and, and, and it worries me that 
okay, are they going to take the box back or you know reduce the the fee, and then jack my jack my uh, my my pricing up just to make up for it. it? It certainly has a lot of appeal that if you could put everything in one box, and you wouldn't have this constant hassle of having to call them. I just I just had funny we you you mentioned this because just the other day. All of a sudden, my Comcast box in the in the bedroom in the kitchen stopped getting the HD channels. I could mm -hmm. still get the SDs, mm -hmm. so it took me fifteen or twenty minutes to work my way through the the menu system to get to a person. But once I did, she was very nice, she was very patient, mm -hmm. you know. And it took another ten or fifteen minutes, and she finally sent a sig a signal through the the lines to the boxes that fixed it. I don't know exactly what she did that fixed it, but it, it fixed it. And so, you know, part of me says, okay, I, I got the result, but the experience, I should never have had to have that problem. What, what changed? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I hadn't touched anything. We hadn't had any thunderstorms, nothing. It just all of a sudden my, my HD was gone. Yeah, well, I, that, that can happen. And yeah, um, oh, so part, part of the issue, um, I, think, I think ultimately, you know, the, comp, the cable boxes, could, could, it could work. I mean, I can see there are some conceptual problems, but the cable boxes could work the same way as TVs. I mean, you don't have to buy TV come from Comcast in order to listen to Comcast. Uh, and ultimately, I think it could be the same thing where you shouldn't have to buy a cable box, uh, set-top box from Comcast either. And now, I, you know, I don't think they're all going to work like TiVo. That would be a problem because if you know, if, if every if every set-top box um, had its own operating system the way TiVo does. That would be a, a big issue. But the idea that you could have a set-top box that not, that's not from Comcast, but yet interfaces with Comcast's Xfinity system, say, um, I think you know, that, that could become relatively transparent, and I don't see why not. Um, maybe there's a reason I don't know, but I, I'd like to think that that's the direction we can go. Yeah. Uh, as far as Comcast itself is concerned, I have to just throw in here, I have massive mistrust of Comcast and, and have had good reason <laughs> to do so over the years. They have never never failed to disappoint me almost whenever the opportunity has come. And But they came through, I have to say, a little bit recently. Uh, one time, uh, I, I think my discount on HBO was was up and they were raising my prices. Uh, you know, I was getting it for free for a year or something like that, and now they're going to start charging me. And so I did my annual call, in which I said, well, I don't want it anymore if I'm going to have to pay for it. Um, and they came back, and they said, not only were they going, were they willing to reinstate it, which is just this game that they play every year, not only were they re willing to reinstate it for free for another year, or $5 a month, I think it actually was, um, but um, but they said, well, we could get the overall price of your bill down by about fifty, sixty dollars a month if I do these sort of changes. And they said, not only that, your bill will drop sixty dollars a month, um, and you'll get some extra services that you don't have now. And not only that, but we'll guarantee that the rates stay into effect for this way for two years, not just for for one year. And so I just I couldn't immediately except I just said I must have been on the phone with them at this point for about 20 minutes um, saying okay why am I going to be sorry that I did this a week from now what what aren't you telling me that's going to change that I'm going to be really annoyed that I, I agree to this you know what what's what's the deception what, I, I kept hammering them saying tell me why this is going to be bad and they couldn't come up with anything. And they said, no, this is just good. And I said, that's never been my experience with Comcast. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out why I will be pissed off when this is all done. Um, <clears throat> but they, 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 they stuck to it. And, and so I eventually said, okay, I'm going to try it. Um, and sure enough, my bill dropped by $60 a month. And, and it's been just enough. And there's been no negative consequence. So <laughs> it actually came through. So. Yeah, and and as I said before, I I've had great experience with the Comcast people. Once I get to a person, but the entity itself, I mean that that's a great story, and it makes me want to pick up the phone and say, okay, what are you doing for Ted that you can't that you could do for me? But it also makes me just a little mad that if you hadn't made that call or you hadn't noticed something on your bill, that it would have jacked up and just kept right on rolling. Oh yeah, and that doesn't feel good. It, it doesn't feel like that's the way you want to treat customers. 
No, well, the whole business of these discounts that disappear after a year is just a bait and switch as far as I'm concerned. They get you, the, the hope is that you'll sign up for it because of the cheap price for the year and then keep going after the year is over and pay the higher price because you just don't care or don't notice. Yeah. I don't know. Once again, we can't fix the world. We can just ask why. Mm -hmm. And we never have any good answers. But we can ask. Yes. I see you have a friend there. Another cat. Yeah. Yes, another one. Yes, I thought I saw a, a tail go up and curl around your neck at one point. Yes, so. they're, all, they're all interested in, in what I'm talking about. I'm sure. They're I'm big sure. They're big techies. They're <laughs> geeks. <laughs> so what, uh, what else is coming up in your life moving forward? Uh, anything in particular? Or do we just plan to get back together in a few weeks and see what's going on? I'm going to Disneyland. Cool. Because I won this podcast. I'm yeah. going to Disneyland. <laughs> Um, yeah, we're taking my, uh, my, my son, his wife, and our granddaughter to Disneyland uh, in a couple of weeks, at the, the very beginning of June. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, let's see. This is, we may, may talk before then. We may talk after then. But if, if we don't talk, have a great time at Disneyland. I, I hope so. <laughs> folks, if you, if you see Ted at Disneyland, tell him you saw him on Mac with Notables. I have the unofficial guide to Disneyland, uh, which which we have read through and has convinced me that, despite the fact that they talk about it in such glowing terms, that Disneyland is potentially the worst place on earth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> because because all you're going to be doing is running around trying to avoid lines all day. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but I knew that going in. So yeah. <clears throat> well, it's it's the whole granddaughter thing that'll that, that'll make it well worth it. Yeah, she's excited. I bet. I bet. We'll talk to you again soon, my friend. Okay. I'll All look right. forward to it. Take care. Okay. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Notables on Mac Voices. We hope we'll see you again here real soon. Uh, and until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, Google+, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and the Mac Voices blog. Subscribe to our weekly newsletter, the Mac Voices Dispatch, to stay up to date on all the latest Mac Voices news from our front page or at macvoices.com slash newsletter. Do more with your Apple tech by subscribing to the free Mac Voices magazine on Flipboard by visiting macvoices.com slash magazine. Advertising and sponsorships handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.